Hey there everyone, and welcome to some more RPG Horror Story Cringe with D&D Doge. In today's episode, we have a tale about one of the grossest players that I have ever read about. Then, we have a story about a dungeon master that comes up with a cool encounter, only for their players to poo-poo all over it. But without further ado, let's get right into these stories. 16 Tons and What Do You Get? By Reddit user... Different Pattern 273 This is a story about a very large man. It's not actually about his weight, so much as it's about how, despite everything that happened, he made it about his weight when he got kicked from my game. But hey, it made for a title at least. The Group No real names, obviously. Me, the lovable DM. My ex, a halfling ranger. Rumi, a human sorcerer wild mage. The bride, one half of a couple, a half-elf bard. The groom, the other half, half-elf rogue. Shy gal, what elf warlock. Oscar, half-orc bloodhunter. This is a story that took place back when Critical Role was wrapping up its first campaign. I hadn't played Dungeons & Dragons in years, but came across their videos and it got me interested in playing again. I start reading up on 5th edition and picked up the original Tal'Dori campaign setting guide. I wanted to run a game in that world that took place some number of years after the show's first campaign. I advertised for players in a local Facebook group with info on the rules, setting, and campaign premise, and I have six players in a couple of hours. Now, I live in a mobile home that I own. At the time, I had a roommate renting my spare room who was joining in, and he's a bit of a germaphobe. I also have a lovable cat named Delphi and this is important for later. I've set up a gaming room. It's a bit cramped, but large enough to seat all of us around a big table that was big enough for my maps and minis. We have a group chat where we take care of all the usual Session Zero things and get all the characters' backstories set up, and everyone is excited for the game. Oscar misses Session 1 due to work, but the game goes great. The party is throwing their lots together in an attempt to take up adventuring, as many groups have tried and mostly failed to do so in the wake of the legendary Vox Machina. They take up a job to investigate some illegal drug trading going on. After some roleplay and checking up on leads, they head out into the swamp to check out a proposed hideout and fend off some giant frogs on the way there. Nothing too harrowing. Week 2, Oscar arrives. He comes early, as requested, so I could catch him up. What pulls up to my house is an unmarked white van. It's full of trash. Like, to the tops of the windows. The dashboard is covered, and there's only a cube of space carved out for the driver of this vehicle. It's so packed in that when he exits, none of it even budges, despite my belief that it would all tumble out into my yard for sure. The man who steps out stands around 6 feet tall and is easily over 500 pounds. With this, I immediately became worried. You see, my house, like many mobile homes, is narrowly designed. Doorways and hallways are skinny. It doesn't seem to bother him though, as he maneuvers sideways through my door and the main hall, so it works out. This is not the reason he was removed. The next problem becomes readily apparent. I can smell him. It's like rotten food or straight up fresh dog crap. And it's powerful. It's in the middle of summer and my house gets warm and I have fans set up in the game room because of this. However, they also blow this smell around as well. He was not removed for this either. He cannot fit into my chairs comfortably so he declares that he will simply sit on my floor if it starts to hurt too much, which is fine, whatever works. After the session, the smell on that chair was so bad, we had to wash them several times and use multiple kinds of deodorizers. Rumi was losing his mind over how disgusting it was, as he could smell it in his room from the game room even after Oscar left. Again, this is not why he was removed, the other players arrive, and I can tell that they all smell it, and they all know why it smelled. I had adjusted the fans while he was in the restroom to blow in such a way that he would be downwind. 
Shy Gal seems especially uncomfortable this session, despite being the best role player at the table. The party joins up with Oscar on the road, having been sent by Groom's Thieves Guild contacts as a backup when they learned just who he was going after. Oscar immediately begins to be incredibly rude and disrespectful to the others. Oscar Guess you're not enough for this, huh? Look like pussies. Though some of you are good to look at. This is directed at our women players. They are nonplussed. Bride And what do we need you for? Groom Well, I did ask for backup, I guess. So his character is an a-hole. Not all characters are good people, and I've played many a-holes myself. It's fun to have them get their comeuppance eventually, too. The party goes along with it, all while grimacing a bit at the repeated off-color jokes that he was making. Eventually, they arrive at the hideout, taking down a patrol silently. They attempt to sneak up on the cabin, and Oscar crit fails. I have players moving on the map to show how they are creeping up, and he was trying to do so right along the front lawn, just creeping through the grass. They are spotted, of course, and all the enemies are alerted, raising alarm to their boss that was making trades inside. Drug dealers. The hell are you doing? Hold it right there. Rumi. Oh, we're gonna die. Shy Gal. Are the rest of us still hidden? Oscar. Ha oh, ha ha ha. Come on, guys. He cries, alerting the enemies that there is more of them. Let's F them. Apparently, he meant that literally, as you will see. Initiative is rolled, and the party enters into the fight of their lives. This was meant to be two or three smaller encounters that have all just bled together, and the party lacks a dedicated healer, so if things go south... My cat Delphi comes into the room. Now... I have a rule about my cat. You do not play rough with her. Do not encourage her to bite or claw. I've had experiences with cats who were taught playtime was to be aggressive and then upset people by biting or scratching them hard. And I make the same request of Oscar when Delphi jumps into his lap. He then proceeds to roughly mash her down onto the floor, ruffling her fur like a dog and teasing her after rolling her onto her back. She's squalling that she does not like this, and he tries to make her play bite his hand. Me. Yo, man, leave my cat alone. Oscar. Gee, sorry, I was just playing. Me. I already told you, we don't play with her like that. That was not the reason he was removed either, though it should have been. Eventually, Oscar eats a critical from the drug dealer boss that should have killed him but he stays alive with the half-work resilience ability. I later learned that this ability doesn't trigger if the attack was enough to kill someone outright, and it was, but I would have let it slide anyway. It's low level and massively unlucky. The party eventually rallies, and Rumi's wild sorcery actually goes off in a beneficial manner. The tides are turned, and they win. Bride, healing word on Shy Gal to get her up. My ex, I'll secure the cabin. Make sure no more surprises are hiding for us. Groom, I'm backing up the ranger in the cabin. Rumi, gonna take a few moments to lose it over all the dead people and still being alive. Oscar, I rip off the leader's pants, flip him over and F his body in the butt. With this, the party grows silent, and I eventually speak up. You what? Oscar, I said I rip off the leader's pants. Me. Dude, I heard you. But no. Just no. Oscar proceeds to pout. The party members in the cabin uncover the stash and some other loot. Suddenly, Oscar just declared himself to be in the cabin, and he steals the money right out of my ex's hands. I'm about to say something when she promptly reminds him that he has one HP left and knocks him right the F out. End of session. So, to recap, he tried to have sex with a corpse, and hardcore sexual content was not allowed as per our session zero. He tried to steal from the party after metagame teleporting to the loot as soon as he heard it was there. And still, these are not the reasons he was removed. 
After the session, everyone thanked me for a good evening and headed out. I had noticed Shy Gal being off all night, so I messaged her after the game, and this is when she drops the bomb. Shy Gal, Oscar and I have played before. We met at a random game store event. He kept being really sexually aggressive with me, and even though I told him no, he follows me to other games and then keeps trying to get in contact with me. And with this, I just responded, Oh, well, he's out then. F that guy. And that is why he was removed. Turned out, I find out later on that he had a habit of doing this to women at tables that he was at and had quite the reputation in the community at large. Now, I'm not one for confrontation myself, and I'm definitely not going to make a player feel even more unsafe by saying she requested that he be removed. So, I decide to let him down easy. Me. After last night's session, I really didn't feel like things worked out the way I would like. I don't think your style is going to be a good fit for our group, but I hope you have good luck in finding another game. And if you need, I can keep you posted if another Taldori setting becomes available from other DMs. Oscar responds, Oh, so you just hate fat people. Not a fit. Real subtle. Yeah, your campaign was trash anyway. I had to make it interesting just to bother to be infested. I don't need help from someone who doesn't accept people. F you. He then promptly blocked me on everything. I informed the group that he was removed without elaborating on why, and no one seemed to mind. Sadly, the game did fall apart about a month and a half later. Work schedules and medical issues for players made it hard to keep on meeting. Shy Gal went on to start running her own games, with safe spaces for women players strictly enforced. Oh, and by the way, I am also overweight. I am honestly surprised that OP put up with as much as he did from Oscar. I mean, just the van he pulled up in, I would be worried that he would bring roaches into my house, as it sounded like that van would have been a breeding ground for them. Not to mention all the other stuff that Oscar did during the game, and then the roughing up of OP's cat, which he would have gotten the boot right then from me. You don't mess with a man's, or in my case, Doge's kitties. I can understand why OP didn't want to give a reason for his removal from the game, as OP stated his reason of not doing so. But at the same time, OP could have given any of the other grievances as to why, instead of just saying that he wasn't a good fit. That way, Oscar wouldn't have the ammo of using his appearance as a cudgel to claim victimhood. Though something tells me that, even if Oscar was given a logical reason, he still would have claimed that OP was a fat phobe even though OP stated that he too was overweight. Let's move on, and before we do, I think we need to get our wholesome levels up after that story. So here is Alice being a little psycho. Thanks Alice, we needed that. Now with that done, let's get into the following story. Co-Designed Encounter Turned Sour by Reddit user Peaceful Knight. Roughly four years ago, I was approached by a former friend of mine to run a campaign for her friends. Having only recently gotten over my fatigue from running sessions twice a week for a year and a half with holidays off, I thought this would be a perfect chance to get back into the swing of things. In this party, we have, with names altered, myself as a DM, Rachel as a pixie druid, Glenn as a High Elf Wizard, Joe as a Tiefling Sorcerer, Devon as a Human Fighter, and Violet as an Asimur Paladin, all starting at level 3 to unlock their subclasses. The first six months went beautifully, with new and old friends engaged with the world of our design. As the sessions continued, however, the few issues we did have started to worsen. Direction was one of the chronic pains that the campaign faced, as a majority of the players wanted to have their turn in the spotlight oftentimes prioritizing themselves over the others in the party. While this certainly did not help us stay civil, communication would ultimately prove to be our downfall. The party has chosen to side with the smaller of two warring states in a kingdom splintered by the death of the previous king. 
They've been made aware of the aggressive state's march from the fort and are asked to assist in preparing against the coming siege. At this point, all players were level 6, having accomplished some notable feats. In addition, they managed to assist the High Elf Mage in repairing a scrapped construct to become a companion for them. This companion, named Penny by Glenn, who was a huge RWBY fan at the time, was a coin sink for the players as they upgraded her into a literal killing machine. After they've made their choice to stay, I ended the session and took the week to prepare the siege, including a surprise boss fight wielding a magic item that could make them have to work together effectively to beat him. But a few days went by with nothing. The players were too strong for most of what the handbook had available to throw at them. The few things that could present a challenge would be unstoppable or nonsensical to have in this engagement. Stumped, but driven to provide them with a challenging encounter, I reached out to Devin and Glenn for assistance. This kind of gathering wasn't uncommon, as I often requested their assistance to ensure encounters were kept fair due to my lack of experience in creating homebrew enemies and items. They devised a shield for the Lord's Son to lead the siege, which could absorb spells to act as charges for a blast attack. Each spell level acted as one charge, and the shield could hold a max of 10. Another few days of tinkering were needed to work out the damage until it would be ready. Session day arrived, and the party decimated the initial wave of soldiers before turning their attention to the particularly angry man in fancy armor. The High Elf Wizard, who had a long history of sadism towards others, cast an AoE spell centered on the fancy man. I was excited. This was the time to show off what we worked so hard on to the rest of the party. The shield is described as illuminating a dimly lit field, and as the light dies out, several runes glow around the center gem on the shield. There was silence before Glenn spoke up in disbelief. What happened? At first, it seemed like he was playing up his surprise for everyone else, until a series of complaints came rushing out from everyone claiming that the shield was unfair. My heart sunk. Even the two who had known about this acted as if the entire thing was my idea. A slurry of accusations from the players and defensive retorts from me ended the session prematurely. They refused to accept that physical damage like ballistas, flintlocks, arrows, and melee weapons would not be hindered by its absorption. But in the end, they required me to retcon the shield's existence before agreeing to continue. We had a few more months of sessions after this, but the relationship between DM and players had become tenuous at best. The entire campaign would collapse after several more months, stemming from out-of-game disagreements. Looking back on it, I am grateful to the players I have now that reignited my passion for tabletop RPGs. It's kind of messed up that the players, especially the ones who helped OP come up with the idea, Flat out refused to play unless OP removed the part of the encounter that he spent the most time on just after one instance of a spell not working. Not only did they stifle OP's creativity and made him feel bad for it, but basically held the game hostage until they got their way. I mean, that sounds like it would be an interesting encounter, and the players would need to use their heads to figure out how to deal with this challenge. And honestly, those are the best kind of encounters in my mind. It forces you as a player to get creative, and once you win, assuming you do so, it feels all that much more awesome. Seriously, these players suck. They didn't care about OP's time that they spent on making the encounter for them, and hell, the entire campaign, and had no regard for how this tabletop strike would make OP feel. In my opinion, after they refused to play unless OP removed the shield, OP should have just packed up their things and just said, Okay, have fun without a DM. Thankfully, it sounds like OP found a new group that actually has an appreciation for OP's time and efforts. But that is all we have time for today. As always, I appreciate all of you, and may your games remain horror story free. Until next time.